My name is Michelle Alexander, and I'm a registered nurse, and I live in a very rural community in Montana. Um, I've been a nurse for 26 years. I'm the mother of two teenage boys, ages 15 and 18. Actually, last night, my oldest son just graduated from high school. Um, very proud mother. My children are, are wonderful. I've lived here in Kalispell for 17 years. Um, I was born in Montana. Um, I've moved around a lot growing up and lived in Portland, Oregon for about 10 years. And after we had our first child, we decided to move back to Montana to raise our children. So that's a little bit about um, my history. So uh, now I've heard a little bit about the story that you uh, make presentations about, which is the, the relationship you had with a lady called Michelle, also mm -hmm. called Michelle. This is Michelle Woodring. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I would very, very much like to hear uh, uh, some more from you, uh, and especially really how, how it affected you, how you found the love in your heart to, to, to be able to uh, support Michelle in the ways that she was asking, and um, what, what you saw as being her experiences as well. Okay, well, it, it was about six years ago, um, I was assigned a, a patient and her name was Michelle, and my supervisor came up to me that morning and said, you're going to be getting a, an interesting patient, and my, I knew when my supervisor came up to me, I thought there's, there's something more here that she's not telling me, because I've done home health nursing and hospice nursing for so long that nothing really was new to me, and she said, your, your, your patient's name is Michelle, and um, there's one thing, a couple of things that you probably need to know before you go see her. And she said the first, first one is that she's blind, completely blind. And I said, wow, that, that will be a first. I've never worked with a completely blind um, patient before. And I said, that will be interesting. And she said, there's one other thing that you need to know about her. Michelle is, is transgender. And I said, okay, that's, that's, that's all right. And um, I didn't, at, at that particular time, I really had no idea what my supervisor was even talking about, um, and I didn't want to uh, let her know that I, I did not know what that term meant, so I just proceeded on and gathered my um, information, and I looked at uh, Michelle's last history and physical from a year prior when she was in the hospital, and the emergency room physician referenced her as a transvestite. And I said, oh, oh, I thought to myself, oh, okay, I know what that is. Um, my only reference point was my mother had taken me to a uh, drag show in Portland, Oregon some 20 years prior. I think I was 21 years old. And um, the reason that she, that my mom took me there was to basically expand my horizons a little bit considering that I was from a very rural um, place in Butte, Montana. And she wanted to show me that there was more diversity out in the world. So that was my reference point. And so I envisioned my patient Michelle having a lot of makeup on, these big evening gowns. Um, so I thought, well, all right, this is going to be, this is going to be interesting. So um, I called her and um, you know, she answered the phone and I told her I was going to be over and, and admitting her to home health. She had a respiratory infection. And when she answered the phone, it, it uh, she was obviously kind of a, a high squeaky voice. And I thought to myself, well, the voice thing isn't working, sweetie. Um, so I was, I was judging her. And so when I went to her home, that was not the case at all. It, uh, she was very ill. And um, for the first three weeks or so, it was like, I, I felt like I was walking on eggshells. I wanted to ask her questions, but I did not, um, I did not want to make her feel uncomfortable. Um, so I didn't. But the one thing that really bothered me about myself at that time is that I really was internally judging her, thinking, you know, this is a lifestyle choice. 
Um, and, and it really bothered me about myself because I really felt that I had mastered being non-judgmental, being a nurse for so long and coming across so many different people in my life. Um, so after about three weeks, she actually broke the ice and, and told me if, if, I had question, if I had the courage to ask, she had the courage to answer. And so that just um, opened up a whole new, I was, I was, she was basically my teacher and I was her student. And I started asking her a lot of questions about her life and she started giving me books to read and videos to watch. And with each new video and each new book that I read, I would go back to her apartment and ask her more questions about being transgender and, and about being blind. Um, and how you know how it was for her growing up. Well, then one day she gave me her journal to read, and this journal she typed on a regular typewriter back in the eighties, and um, it was she gave that to me, and it was um, I read it from the beginning to the end in one evening, and it was her journal over about a three two and a half year period of time where she was actually transitioning from Michael to Michelle. And that was here in Kalispell, Montana. And at that time, there was probably maybe 7,000 people here. And when I read that, it was my, that's what opened my heart to her. And I understood. I understood that I was the one that was being blind and that being transgender had nothing to do with the look it had nothing to do with um, a lifestyle choice. Her journal was filled with such emotional pain and such rejection that at, at that time I just knew uh, she just needed a friend and she needed somebody to reach out to her. So shortly after, after that, I actually went to a, um, a Catholic Crisil. And I'm not Catholic and it was my dad asked me to go with my stepmother and um, because she wouldn't go unless I didn't. It was like a three, three, four day retreat. And I said, sure, I'll go. I'm sure that there's something that I can take from that that will benefit me. So I went and the, the whole theme of the event was love one another. And the entire time that I was there, I kept thinking about my friend Michelle, thinking, you know, would, would, these people that are are talking about loving one another, would they accept and love Michelle just for who she is, the person that she is internally? And um, when I came home from that experience, the next, the, the following day, I don't know if you call it an epiphany or what, but I knew at that moment, it. I had this this aha moment that wow, she was going to die. And um, I had nothing to really base that on physically. She was pretty compromised, but I really felt that she was doing okay and that she would eventually be discharged from home health, you know, and get over her respiratory infection. But after, after that moment, I, I knew that Michelle was going to die. And I also knew why I was put in her life. I knew that I had to help her through the emotional journey of the dying process and I also knew that my role was to make sure that she knew that she was 100% unconditionally loved and accepted before she died. Um, and so when I had that, that moment, um, at first I thought, wow, okay, here we go. I, you know, from my hospice background, I knew that when I would make a very deep soul-to-soul -soul connection with another, another human being that was on their way out of, of this world, that it, it's extremely, um, can be very draining on me, and because I will give, I will give a hundred percent. So I knew at that point, it, it felt like a, that I was asked, um, by God to, to, to do this, and so I said, okay, I will do it. So after that, I, I just, um, I really started crossing boundaries, professional boundaries, which I rarely did, um, you know, as a nurse. But I, I gave Michelle my email. She had my, my um, cell phone number. I started visiting her on my off time. Um, I introduced my children to her, 
and um, and that was my children at that time were ages nine and twelve, and I thought, wow, um, you know what 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 do I tell them? Because Michelle was very tall; she was six feet two inches tall, um, or maybe even maybe even taller than that, and um, she was you know she had male features, so. At that time, I, I we decided to tell our oldest son the truth, and um, yeah, about her, and my youngest son. I just I just told him that she was blind and that she was a very tall woman. So we went over and introduced my children to her, and it was amazing because when we came home that night, I asked my oldest son. I said, "Do you have any questions? You know that I can answer for you and." And he said, he said to me, Mom, she's really nice. And he said, it doesn't matter what's on the outside. It matters what's on the inside. Um, that's what counts. And so it was another, another one of those aha moments that, wow, here my 12-year-old son gets the meaning of unconditional love and acceptance. So... After that, my, my youngest son and Michelle developed a very, very close relationship. Um, she taught him how to read Braille. Um, they, they played chess together. But during this whole time, just watching her and, and you know, listening to her story and what a tough life she's had and how much rejection that she faced and how, how cruel people can be, it just... Um, it just really opened up my heart to the power of love and and not only you know giving your giving of oneself but accepting that love too michelle really opened my heart as far as you know she demonstrated to me um what it what it really meant to open up your heart and your soul to another human being she was. She showed me her vulnerability. She, you know, we we had some very, very emotional talks about about where she was at in her life, and you know, we frequently would question why it is it was that our paths met, and um, she knew. She knew. She said, "You're in my. You've been put in my life to to help me out of this life." And and I and I so she knew what was going on and um, I asked her well why why have you been put into my life and she said oh that's easy that's so that I can educate you on the true internal landscape of um, what transgender means and you're going to turn around and educate other people and I said well I know that I I knew that but I said there's more to it there's more to it and. So I questioned that um, that question, and I found my answers after after she passed away, and it was basically to learn about my own authenticity, and to also learn unconditional love and acceptance of um, not only just others but of, of myself as well, and to teach other people the same thing. Um, so after. It was just such a divinely guided experience. It was really quite amazing. Um, the, a week in August, so it's about f almost four and a half months, um, there was a, week, a day in August that I had previously, several months ago, taken the whole entire week off, and I had already made arrangements with my mother-in-law. She was gonna take my boys for a couple of days, and this was arranged way before I met Michelle. And um, before that week, Michelle had two caregivers, and they both wanted uh, Thursday and Friday off, and asked me if I could go and help her, um, you know, take care of her for a few hours. And I said, "Sure, I'd love to do that. I'm off work, you know." So I went. I drove about two hours and dropped my kids off, at, um, so my mother-in-law could pick them up. And on my way back. I again had that same feeling that I had um, after I got back from the Catholic Cusil. I, I was overcome with emotion and started crying and thought, wow, well, something's going to happen this week. And I had really no basis to 
you know, to feel that way because again, physically Michelle was doing very well. Um, I mean, not well, but she was she was stable, and there was nothing really going on to indicate that she was declining. But so I I went home, and at that time I I told my spouse I said, you know, I, I have a bad feeling about this week. Something's going to happen. And he said, well, maybe you're reading too much into it. I thought, you know what, you're right, I am. Um, so I just kind of let it go, but I thought to myself, wow, something really does happen this week. This whole event was just divinely orchestrated. So as the week went on, um, I was visiting with Michelle on a Tuesday, and she said the same thing to me. She said, I have a bad feeling about this weekend. And I said, do you think you're getting worse? And she said, sometimes yes and sometimes no. What do you think? And I said, you know, sometimes I do and some same thing. But, but I said, I think you're, you're doing okay. So um, Thursday rolls around and um, I brought her over to my home and um, she kept falling asleep. And that's not like her. She was not a napper, but she kept falling asleep, and she almost acted like she was over-medicated. So when she was over at my house that day, I decided to count her medications um, and, and to see just, you know, was she taking too many? And uh, I was really looking forward to taking care of her on Thursday and Friday so that I could see what she was doing with her medications. And when I counted all of her medications, it was clear that it was not, you know, that she was not taking too many medications and and that whole entire day Thursday um, she didn't take anything and she had medications for pain and she had medications that would help her with her shortness of breath um, but she didn't take anything and she was not in pain and she was not having any shortness of breath but she was just drowsy and kinda had a little bit of a slurred speech so I brought her home that Thursday night and I got her all all tucked in and um, I called her on my way back home and she didn't answer the phone and I called her again and, and by that time she did answer and she had had a fall and she was okay she got back in her recliner and I said well I'll be there in the morning so on on Friday morning I went there and it was the same thing I couldn't put my finger on it you know her vital signs were fine everything everything checked out fine but she just was not acting her normal self she again she just was kept falling asleep um, and she got up and went over to her computer and she was amazing being blind her her ability to to work her computer was incredible and she was responding to an email and she kept saying I don't know what's going on here because she was she was at, and I went and looked looked at what she was doing she was trying trying to type the message in the the subject area of the email so I told her what she was doing you know what she needed to do we needed to move her cursor down and and she basically just said oh I'll, I'll worry about it later well that wasn't like her either because she, she that would have you know that would have drove her nuts why can't I figure this computer out so she went back into her recliner well by that afternoon I got really worried and I thought something's not right here and I started crying and she's you know and she said what's wrong and I said I don't know I don't know something's not right and um, so I her caregiver by that time was back and I called her caregiver and her caregiver said why are you crying to me and I said I don't know I just have a feeling it's the beginning of the end and can you come check on her tonight and make sure that she's okay and possibly st spend the night and her caregiver said, well, I can't spend the night, but I will make sure that she's okay and make sure that she has something to eat. So I went home and I again started crying and I just said, this, this something is, something's not right here. Something's not right. So I, my spouse at the time said, well, why are you questioning your intuition? And I said, you know what? You're right. I need to go back there and I need to spend the night. So I went back and, um, spent the evening with her and you know we always had this we, we had this promise to one another that I would always be very open and honest with her as to how I felt that she was doing physically so at that time I I told her I said I don't know what's going on but I have a feeling it's the beginning of the end and um, 
it was it was very emotional and basically we said our goodbyes and I helped her with a bath and I helped her get cleaned up and um, she had just had a hospital bed delivered that day and I asked her where she wanted to sleep and she said well I'll try the bed so I got her all tucked in and she had a dog next to her and a cat next to her and I said you know I'll be here uh, right on the floor so I grabbed a pillow and a blanket and, and lay down on the floor and about three o'clock in the morning I thought well I'm gonna turn the light on and see how she's doing and and I did and um, she was semi-responsive she was actively dying and um, she had been incontinent so at that time my my nursing instincts just clicked in and I told her I said okay sweetie it's just little old me and and big old you I've got to get you cleaned up and and um, so I gave her a bed bath and and talked to her and got her cleaned up and and then I just spent the last couple of hours talking to her and um, telling her to let go that it was her time um, that it was going to be okay that um, she was loved and basically she she died in my arms she died at seven o'clock next morning with me holding her um, so and she died peacefully she died comfortably and she died knowing that she was loved unconditionally and the amazing process was that she came to a, a an unconditional love of herself and of her of her what she always perceived of as her duality and um, which I I never really perceived it in, in that manner because I think we all ha we all have um, two sides to us we all have our our dark side and our light side or the ego and the and, and the you know the, our higher self but I, I really feel that that Michelle when she came to the, the unconditional love and acceptance of herself she was finally able to go um, she was able to let go and and um, and die and so it was just such a profound experience for me um, after after she died it uh, it, it was just it, it was actually that was the beginning of my spiritual journey because again it was I was so amazed by by how it happened and just having a knowing you know after I went to that Catholic Casilla why I was in her life and just watching things unfold and kind of having that knowing even before it was going to happen it was pretty profound um, so after after she died I I again had another little moment of um, you, it was it was it was kind of one of those moments of oh you want me to do what now you want me to write a book you've got to be kidding um, number one I, I don't like to write and um, number two is, is I'm a very poor writer and and I'm not saying that to you know criticize myself but it's the truth and I'm okay with that writing's never been um, a strength of mine but I thought okay I thought you know if that's what's meant to happen then then it will happen and the right people will show up in my life um, to help me uh, tell this story but I knew that I, I needed to tell her story um, as, as a way to open up hearts and minds um, not only for the transgender community but that mainly was I, I felt like I was an ally and Michelle was a true example of, of how how being a transgender has it, it comes from within you know she was blind from the time she was 18 months old she never had a visual construct of you know the, the physical differences between what a male looked like versus a female she could never look at me and say that's how I want to dress that's how I want to act it came from within and her story is proof of that so I, I knew that 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 was again my my role now is to you know is to open people's hearts and, and minds to this community they are just human beings um, no different than myself and they go through so much heartache and so much ridicule and so much rejection that it just it just 
saddens my heart. Um, you know, so my, my experience with, with Michelle is, is how I started learning about my own authenticity um, and what, what truly mattered. And it's, it, it's so basic, you know, Michelle might have been a very complex human being, other people might have looked at her as complex, but really she was very, very simple. She's no different than myself and anybody else. All she was looking for was to be accepted and to be loved. That's all. And through my experiences, um, after writing this book, and I'm going to back up a little bit. When I wrote the book, The Color of Sunlight, um, it took me about a year and a half to write down, well, about two years. It took me about two years, and I, I had to do everything by long hand. And, and then I would go back and type it in the computer and then re redo it and redo it and redo it. Well, again, I just, I had faith that I knew that this is what, it, 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 that this is what I was supposed to be doing and that the right people would show up. Well, it just so happened that my co-writer, her name is Michelle also, um, she was just kind of plopped into my lap. And it, it was amazing um, how, how the whole thing un unfolded. Um, I was on a computer and I, I was on a forum and I was reading about her story and just said, geez, you, there's a lot of similarities between your story and, and my patient, Michelle. And she wrote back to me and said, you know, um, what is a, a trans woman doing in Montana? Thinking, you know, referring to me. And I said, no, 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 go back and read a little bit about my journey with my patient. So she did. And she wrote back to me and said, oh my gosh, you know, this is your destiny. You must write this story and, you know, write about Michelle's life. And, and I wrote back to her and I said, oh, I already did. I'm, I'm already done with, with what I can do with, with my part of the story. I'm just looking for the right person to show up to help me finish it. And she wrote back to me and she said, perhaps am I the writer that you're looking for? And, and I said, yep, you're it. So she is the one that took my 180 pages and, you know, I gave her the foundation and she's the one who, who put the walls up and hung the pictures and and took my my story and made it into the book that it is so that's that's a little bit about my journey um, and again it's it's Michelle my patient is the one who opened up my heart to the power of unconditional love loving someone from from who they are inside on a soul to soul um, basis, no expectations, um, no, no prerequisites, just loving from that, from our higher self. And it's such a beautiful experience when we can both give that love and also to receive somebody else's unconditional love it can be very powerful. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about, about my journey and and what I learned from my blind transgender patient. Um, I also, I also during that time of writing about my experience with her, that is when I again started my own spiritual journey and started my own um, look into being authentic and what that means and the masks that we wear to, in order to be accepted. Um, so I thought to myself, Wow, that's why she was really, really put into my life. It was not only to just ed to educate other people regarding, you know, the true internal landscape of of being transgender. It was part of my own soul's evolvement, and and it was because of what she showed me and and taking, you know, um, sh her showing me her vulnerability and her true um, person that she was helped me to evolve. As well, and that is that is the, the lesson that I needed to to learn from my patient Michelle. Gosh, that's a, that's a really wonderful story. So you you brought each other to unconditional love, really, and now you're bringing other people to unconditional love too. Yes, 
Yes, and the the people that I've met along this journey have been amazing. I have um, I have met so many transgender people, um, and I tell you what, they are the most authentic people I've ever met in my life because they they have had to strip themselves um, internally and externally just to be who they are inside. Um, like, so I said, I, I learned so many lessons from that community on what it, true authenticity really means. And they're the most loving, giving um, people I've ever met in my life. And true, they're just, they're so true. Um, so I learned from, I still learn from that community every day. So I still feel that that's part of my um, purpose here in this world is to again open people's hearts and minds to uh, the transgender community um, that they are just people too and they're no different you know being transgender is no different from they're human beings that need love and compassion and um, just the power of, of, of love we all need it that's the basic survival need And what are you doing now to, um, to to help people to understand this? Are you going out giving talks, presentations? What, what are you doing? Um, well, it's kind of twofold. Um, I have given several talks to um, different organizations, and, and and that has opened up some doors. Um, the, the one organization that that asked me to come speak was um, uh, Unitary. Unitarian Universalist Church in Billings, where you, where you were at, they asked me to come and tell my story, and and um, that was a wonderful experience because again, I thought, geez, if I can open just one heart and one mind, then I I've done my job. So I've been doing a, a lot of speaking that way, and the other thing that I've I've done in the last couple of years. Um, after after Michelle died is is I got my certification as a life coach and I think another part of my purpose and it's it's still everything's kind of evolving and unfolding as it as it's meant to be but is to to um, coach other people including the transgender community on um, stepping into your greatness and learning again how that starts it starts with unconditionally loving ourselves, all of ourselves, without judgment, and um, so that's that's what I'm doing as well. So I I'm not really sure where things are going to go from here, um, but I'm just letting things unfold the way that they're they're supposed to, and I tr try to keep growing and changing and evolving um, my own self so that I can help others to do the same. Beautiful. And I can imagine that when you're talking to people, you'll find that quite a lot of people are really profoundly affected by your story. Yes. Yes. I, um, I, think, it do, I think it does have a lot of power in to, to just open some hearts and minds on, on the power of unconditional love and, and reaching out and giving to another. and. And, and then also receiving that other person's love as well. Um, and it's, it's just, it's so, it's such a beautiful feeling when, when you can connect to another human being on, on a true soul to soul level.